Well, welcome today for those who are watching online. And if it's your first time here in the sanctuary, we say welcome. It's if, if it's your first time watching online, we want to encourage you to go to our website, fill out the connection form there. We'd love to connect with you. My name is Dan Grittner. And on behalf of my beautiful wife, who is not feeling well today, she sends her love to you. Uh, she just could not make it to the service today. We're glad that you guys are here. Um, a couple of announcements. One is this thing super cool that we're putting together, something called the Lions Club. And uh, we're excited about this. This is for those of you in here again, or online, who, man, you're an entrepreneur in our city. Um, you're a leader in our city. You just have an eye for seeing things beyond what they are. If, you're a little, if your friends think you're a little bit crazy, this group is for you. All right. And if you want more information, Raquel wave to us right here. Raquel Bell, she can give you more information on what it's about. We're having a meetup uh, the last Saturday in October at Common Grounds Coffee. It's going to be a great time. There's more information on our website, free pastries and coffee for everyone who uh, registers. So check out our website. We'd love to host you and, and serve you that day. Now, today is going to be the last, uh, ser last message in a series that we've been calling The Unstoppable Church. We spent a long time in this series and uh, we're excited about what we have next. I'll just tell you, next week, Pastor Glenn Schaefer is going to be here. He's an apostolic father. He's amazing. You should come. And then the week after that, Pastor Jonathan Cook is going to be in the place. They're all coming as a result of the His Church Conference that we'll be having at the end of October. So they're coming in uh, for that. So this will be the last series of that and then we'll move on to another one. But before we get into the text message, uh, where did that come from? Before we get into the text message, my God, I'm having a pregnant brain. Any, has any, is there any guys here when your wife was pregnant, like you feel the symptoms too? Anybody? I'm not the only one. Okay. It's like real, real life right here. Of course, we don't feel it as bad. I'm sure. But it is a thing. It's because we're connected. Isn't that what the Bible said? We're one? All the ladies are like, stop it. Don't even, don't even talk about that. You don't have no idea. And I would say you're absolutely right. But um, anyways, before we get into the text, we have a super special day today because today is October 8th, and it happens to be Carla Francis's birthday in the house. <laughs> Carla, man, we just love you so much. We honor you. Your gift and your labor in this community is significant, and we just thank you so much for who you are. It's a blessing. Let's give Carla a big happy birthday on three. One, two, three. Happy birthday, Carla. Wow. They've brought a cake for us to enjoy, so after service, make sure to eat whatever food we have over there as long and, and as well as her cake and tell her happy birthday. Uh, last message in this series, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 18. I feel like I'm ready to preach. Are y'all ready to receive it? Yes. All right, Ephesians 6, one little verse here. This closes up and sums up the armor of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. He continues, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. I want to talk to you from the message, polish the armor, polish the armor. We have a great thing going on in Miami and um, his name is Tua. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. If you don't like the dolphins, it's all right, because we're going to talk for a little bit. You can go back to the state that wherever you came from, because <laughs> right up in here, uh, Tua is a young man, is a man of God, really. I don't know if you saw online on Facebook or something. Uh, he was at this press conference, and he talked about how he was a Christian. He talked about his upbringing, and he didn't just do like some rock stars or music entertainers do, you know, when they accept the word, I want to thank Jesus Christ, and they go on like cussing and talking about all their women and all that. No, this kid went on and talked about his upbringing in the church, and uh, if you didn't see his interview there, he talked about he, how he prays all the time. He even said he prays in the spirit, he prays in tongues, he's my boy for real. 
And he says, sometimes I'm praying on the sideline and people might think I'm talking to myself, but I'm really praying. He said this. I was like, wow, this guy is so awesome. So we pray for Tua. And uh, 2017, he was the quarterback at Alabama. He was actually the backup quarterback all year. And at halftime in the championship game, his team was down 13 to nothing at halftime. When they came out, here comes Tua. The coach made a change. And they came back and brought the game into overtime. And he says in overtime on the final drive, he was praying in tongues in the huddle. And he threw this epic pass. And they won the game in overtime. And he won the trophy for Alabama. I want to talk to you today that prayer brings the trophy home. Yes, it does. Prayer brings the trophy home. Uh, the person who taught me how to pray was Pastor Tom Peters from Trinity Church International. Now, if you don't know Pastor Tom, he is a man of prayer. In fact, I personally think I have no say in the matter, but I personally think on his tombstone, it only needs to say he prayed. He was a man of prayer. And um, he, the church is, sits on 33 acres right on military trail. All 33 acres, every blade of grass is debt free. There's seven buildings on the property along with a school, and it's all debt-free. It's all paid for. And a number of years ago, I was going to school. I was going back to school. I was getting a master's degree in leadership, and I'm reading all about these great leaders, and I'm learning about leadership principles, and I don't know how it hit me. I think I was drinking some Starbucks coffee one day, and boom, it hit me. I'm doing a degree on leadership. I need to talk to Pastor Tom Peters about some leadership. I mean, 33, I mean, we had, or I don't, not we, he had about 100 employees that he oversaw every day, about 60 employees at the school. The school had eight to 900 kids every day on the property, and then about 40 or so employees at the church. And he and his wife just came from North Florida, 1973. How do I know that? Because I was the year after the Dolphins went undefeated. Come on, somebody. You never forget things like that. Important things right now. And, and they just built it up. We gave, or he gave, or the church gave, a million dollars to missions every single year. Okay? Literally, the world was touched and changed by my pastor. This guy's a great leader. So I would go up to him and I said, hey, pastor, let me ask you a question. Of course, I met him after prayer. And I said, y'all, you know, I'm going back to school for leadership. I just have to ask you a question. He goes, sure, Dan. I go, how'd you do it? He goes, do what? I said, how do you and your wife do all this? I said, Pastor Peters, I'm going back to school for leadership. Can you give me just a leadership nugget? I'll never forget it. He said, well, Dan, I just really believe in prayer. And I sat there saying, that must be your introduction to this five minute, something else that you're going to give me. And, and, and he just nodded. And I said, oh, that's cool. Is there anything else? Nope, that's it. And I, I said, okay. And, I, and, and about two weeks later, I said, that he must have been having an off day, something going on. Two weeks later, I go back to him. Hey, pastor, how you doing? Uh, j just a question. Um, Leadership nugget time. Can you tell me how you did it? Like, I need some leadership nuggets. He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, look, all this stuff here, 100 employees started from nothing. How'd you do it? And he goes, well, Dan, you know, sorry to disappoint you. It's the same answer of life last time. I just really believe in the power of prayer. And we did this conversation about five or six times over the years. And now we laugh at it because I know what his answer is going to be now. But he's the one who taught me how to pray. And I said, Pastor, you have to give me a little bit more insight than just, I believe in the power of prayer. Can you please just tell me a little bit? Like, okay, so why is that the thing? He says, well, Dan, prayer is just God's way. I was talking to the team earlier at, um, at Team Rally. We have pre-service prayer, and we have Team Rally where we circle up and kind of get a, a gist of what's going on for the day. And, and, I thought, and I thought this thought 
So many times, how many times, church, do you and I, maybe not you, maybe it's just me, but how many times do we as people just gloss over prayer? Like, yeah, I need to pray about that. You know, I need to pray for so-and-so. I need to pray about this situation. But, but really not putting the hand to the plow and digging into prayer. This is a bold statement. I don't want anyone to get offended. But, but if you think about it, think about it like this. Would we be so arrogant not to pray? Wow, like I'm just really challenged, right? If, if, if we see the pattern of Christ where Christ spends all night in prayer, 40 days in prayer, modeling the way of prayer, the early apostles modeling burden carried with prayer, and we think our little technology from Steve Jobs is going to get the job done. Would we be so arrogant not to pray? I believe the unstoppable church is the praying church. Isn't that right? That is what the unstoppable church is, is a praying church. Now, remember, when we talk about the church, you and I, we understand that that's not an organization, but the church is the people and individuals. So if we agree that the unstoppable church is the praying church, we can also say the unstoppable person is the praying person. But listen to me, if the unstoppable person is the praying person, what is the person that doesn't pray? So we want to be a praying person. People, look at 2 Chronicles 7.14. The Old Testament writer says this, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... That's a powerful little four-letter word for you. It's better than the four-letter words you've been saying all week. <laughs> Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal, heal their land. Now, the context of this really, it's really significant, this context in Second Chronicles. What was happening here was that the people of Israel, the children of God, okay, and specifically the King Solomon, who's an Old Testament figure, they were building the temple of God. They were like building the first church building of our, of our faith, of the Jewish faith. It was the first temple that was built. And temples in ancient culture, we know, were very significant, right? I mean, people would work at all, uh, worship at all kinds of pagan cultures. It's where they would meet with the gods. It's where they would sacrifice in pagan cultures. They would sacrifice children. They would have incredible orgies. They would worship their God with just bloodthirsty sex fests and feasts. And so the temple was where God worked. And the Bible here says in the Old Testament that because of this temple, it was going to give glory to God, that all nations could look at that temple, they could see it over the hill, and they could say, that's where God is. There's all this pagan stuff going around in all these other nations, but in Israel, that temple is where God is. That's where we get the phrase like, leave the fire on the altar. I'll pray all night where the altar incense comes up. So there was this incense, there was this worship of uh, this fragrance of God so that everyone could know that's the house of God. Now, this is the Old Testament. How do you think that applies to you and I today in the New Testament? Well, you and I are the temples of God. You and I are the temples. So just like in the Old Testament, that temple was to give glory to God. You and I today are to be little temples all over Palm Beach County, bringing glory to God. So you could work in a garage business, supposed to be giving glory to God. You could work in a hospital, give glory to God. You could work at Chase Bank, let the incense rise up. You could be in the public school and people say, man, that person smells different. You could be in the counselor's office and they say, this one's a little bit different. 
You could work on boats. And someone says, man, that person's got a different thing going on than the other people around my thing. Why? Because we are the temple of God giving glory to God. Do I got anybody in the house today? And so we see here then that the first ministry of the church is to pray. I want to talk just a little bit about the first ministry. Someone say the first ministry. The first ministry of the church is to pray. It's not to feed the homeless. It's not to be on the right side of political issues. The first ministry I'm talking about. It's not to have a nice little cute little service. The church was birthed in prayer. And the church will be sustained through prayer. It's through prayer that we overcome. It's through prayer that we have our victory. Through prayer, we kill our enemies. It is our battle. It is our sword. And it is our fight. Prayer brings the breakthrough. It's like a cold winter's breeze. It's like a cold glass of ice water on a hot day. It'll put a fire in your belly and vision in your eyes. Friends, prayer is the key. It's the key. Prayer, prayer, prayer is what your house needs. I like what Pastor Glenn was saying. Pastor Glenn, he'll be here next Sunday. He is a man of prayer, and he leads an apostolic network on his knees, much like Pastor Peters. And he said when he was a little boy, his dad was a pastor and his, and his, and his mom was a pastor's wife obviously. And he said his mom was the most praying person that she ever known. And she would pray in the bedroom and he could hear her praying all the time. He could hear mom praying. And when he began to, when he began to, when he began to say that, that did something for me to say, are my kids hearing daddy pray? Oh, they hear daddy yell at the TV when Tua doesn't do good. They might hear daddy yell in frustration, but do they see daddy praying? That's powerful thought, isn't it? Prayer is the key. I'm reminded of Martin Luther, the 16th century monk in Germany. This man right here literally has affected your life, even though he lived in the 1500s. Martin Luther, he was a monk. And at that time, the Catholic Church had a chokehold on the people. The sermons in the masses was done in Latin. So I don't know if you've ever been in a, in a service where you didn't know the speaker or what they were saying. But how many of you know it doesn't really help you unless there's a translator? So the Catholic Church would do the Mass in Latin for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so the people living in Germany who spoke Germany obviously did not understand what was happening. And the church began to sell, you remember this from history, that they would sell indulgences. They would say, do you want your loved ones to be go to heaven? Your loved ones are in purgatory right now. And, and if you want to get them to heaven, you got to give us money and then we'll get them to go there. And it was payment for sins. And it's how the Catholic church got their money. And one day, this monk, this Catholic monk, Martin Luther was reading in the book of Galatians. And he found out that salvation doesn't come by what we do and don't do. Salvation is found in Christ, in Christ alone. And so he had that famous day on 1517, October 31st, where he took 95 theses or 95 thoughts and he nailed them to the Catholic door. Really what it was, it was like an op-ed. It was like a New York Times best-selling article. It was like your Facebook post to your 250 friends. Everybody knew it. It was the bulletin board of the day. And that moment in history has affected the way you conceive and understand God today as a Protestant evangelical Christian. He changed the world. And, he, and, and then actually he became, the printing press was uh, 
formed about 50 to 60 years before this. And so it kind of lined up perfectly with the Gutenberg printing press because he was able to print a bunch of Christian literature that was meeting to the people. He was like the first Christian rock star. He was the Instagram star of the day. He was very popular and he was very busy and getting biblical literature to the people. And he was changing their mindset in that, oh my God, I, don't, I can actually save my money. I don't have to pay for my sins. I can go to Christ directly. I don't need the priest, all of that. And he said this great line within all of that sphere and all of that buzzing around and world world around his ministry and his life, he said this, I have so much to do today that I am going to need to spend the first three hours in prayer. I really like that quote. Why would he say that? I have so much to do today. Because I have so much to do today, I need to spend the first three hours in prayer. Why would he say that? And what a statement to us today who feel busy. Thank you, Martin Luther. I want to give you three aspects of prayer, or I should say three reasons why we should pray. Okay. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. Number one, here it is. Why should you pray today in this 21st century world that you're living in, in Palm Beach County? Number one, you should pray because prayer keeps the soldier ready for battle. This is why you should pray. I love what Pastor Peters taught us. He said, look, you're going to pray in your life. Even atheists pray in a foxhole. Everybody prays. But you're either going to be, he said, a choice prayer or a crisis prayer. Two different types of people. Now, a crisis prayer, they only pray when there's a crisis. And they pray from crisis to crisis. A choice prayer has a time to pray. They have an order in their prayer life. They know when they're going to be praying, and most times they are faithful to that. Now, crisis prayers let the devil order their prayer life. But choice prayers let the Lord order their prayer life. So we want, we're going to pray. We obviously don't want to be crisis prayers. We want to be choice prayers. Prayers. And so the question to you is, I guess the real application to you is, is what is your times of prayer? And it's different for everybody. It looks different for everybody. I remember one time when we were, when we were uh, planting the church, this is not the best example, but it shows you where I was at. In 2019, we started the church, September 2019. That's when we officially launched, but we were working on it for about a year to, to, to gain, you know, people basically and building the team and the culture. And I went and I, and, and I, um, for some reason, every day I was on military trail going south, getting the red light right at 10th and military. And that was a curse at first, but then it became a blessing. It was a curse because no matter what, that red light was stopping me. It was another curse because that might be the longest red light in Palm Beach County. But it was a blessing, and I'm embarrassed to tell you, but this is the truth. It was a blessing because that was my prayer time. Now, that's a two-minute prayer time for a pastor. You should get like a big old fat F. Your prayer life sucks. But launching a church, I mean, you're thinking about all the details. That's where I was at. And I was at a, I was at a pastor's meeting one time and they were talking about prayer. And they said, hey, go around and tell us your time of prayer. I said, y'all want to hear something real? They said, yeah. Yeah, brother, why don't you tell us? I said, my prayer time is at 10th and military. And they're all like, oh, you do a prayer walk? I said, no, that's just a two minute wait that I have. That's my prayer time right there. And the guy leading it, he's a good friend of mine. He just goes, hmm, creative. That was my prayer time. That's, that's what I had. Now, thankfully, my prayer life has grown beyond those two minutes. But sometimes you got to start with where you're at. And, and le- at least there was some dedication there. Here's the thing. Prayer keeps us ready for battle. I like this illustration. Prayer to the Christian soldier is like polish to his armor. Prayer keeps the armor up to date. 
Is your faith shield weakened? You need to pray. Is your head going crazy that you don't even know if you're saved? You need to pray. Have your shoes of peace? You lost your peace? You need to pray. You see, this is the, this is the armor of God we've been talking about in this series. And prayer is the thing that keeps your armor ready for battle. Can you imagine a soldier who does not have his armor in order? I love watching movies. And one of the movies is you have the, the, if it's a, like a 15th century, 16th century setting, and there's a castle and there's this guy on the castle at night and he's overlooking to see if anybody's out there and he's looking for moving bushes. And all of a sudden you'll see this like arrow of fire coming towards the castle. You know, to the scene that I'm talking about. And when they see that first battle cry coming from the enemy, they yell to the soldiers, wake up, get ready. And you see all these soldiers breaking out of their barracks. And what do they do? The first thing they do, you'll see them grabbing their sword, grabbing their shield, grabbing their helmet, right? Well, every time I've watched the movie, the armor of those soldiers is in order, that it's ready to go. Can you imagine a soldier saying, oh, hold up, where's my shoes? Oh, hold up, I can't find my shield. Oh, hold on, I don't know where my sword is. How many of you know, if that were to happen, that brother's gonna be dead, isn't he? So prayer is so vital for you. Why? Because it keeps you ready for the battle. When you stay in that atmosphere, we're not talking about being super spiritual. We're not talking about being religiously goofy. We're just saying we recognize that this thing is God's way and I want to be everything that God's called me to be. So I'm going to be ready in prayer. Is someone with me today? Number two, the second reason why you should pray is number one, because prayer causes you to thrive. Someone say thrive. I like what William Gennard said, the great 16th century Puritan, excuse me, 17th century Puritan. He said this, the praying Christian is the thriving Christian. Is that not good? The praying Christian is the thriving Christian. If you want to thrive in your Christian life, if you want to be an overcomer, if you say, dude, I come to service in this cafe. Look, if you come to service in this cafeteria, I already know you're like four steps ahead of maybe some others because you're committed. You're, there's something in your heart that says, I want to touch from God today. And so prayer is that thing, is that thing that allows you to thrive and to thrive well. It's like this. It's like when we work out, which I don't work out that much, but I better start working out before these twins come because I'm going to be like, I better get in shape a little bit. In fact, I told Ethan that. I said, Ethan, I'm going to have to work out my muscles. And I hadn't been to the gym in a minute. And he goes, Daddy, you hadn't been to the gym. I go, oh yeah, what happened? He goes, you better go there to build up your muscles. But when you go to the gym, some of you are faithful. It does something to your appetite, doesn't it? Obviously. Some of you, that was a distant memory. But when you go to the gym, you know your body craves protein. Your body's saying to you, hey, give me some chicken. I need some steak. I need some some potatoes. Because why? When you put in physical exercise, what comes back to you is an appetite for more nutrients. But how many of you know when we're slothful, then our appetite weakens for less desirable things? I like what C.S. Lewis said. He said, spiritually, um, spiritual nurture, which is what we're talking about, like bodily nurture, will be served. In other words, you will serve your spirit something and you will serve your body something. But if you deny your spirit proper food it will gobble poison. See, we're going to feed on something in the natural and in the spirit. We're going to feed on something. If we're putting out, I'm going to feed on spiritual things, what's going to happen is more spiritual things are going to come to you. That's what it is. So feed on the spirit, feed on prayer. He's going to give you an appetite for more feed on the spirit. He's going to give you an appetite for his word feed on the spirit. He's going to give you an appetite for faith. 
Feed on the spirit. He's going to give you an appetite to seek godly wisdom. Feed on the spirit and he's going to give you an appetite to show love. Feed on the spirit and your spirit will tell you, I need more of that. So prayer causes us to thrive. It puts our soul and mind in the right direction. I wrote this down. I like this. Prayer gives us the mind of God. This might not be for you. We don't need more of what we think. We need more of what God thinks. Can I talk to you real strong? You don't need more of what you... Well, I just think, well, you should just shut up. Let me stop. I like messing with you. I'm trying to help you today. We don't need more what we think. We need more of what God thinks. Last thing I want to tell you. Prayer conforms us to Christ. Okay? Prayer conforms us to Christ. Listen to this. The first order of prayer is not to get something done on the outside but that something will be done on the inside of you. See, let me, let me say this. In our, in, our, in our continuum of life, if we're always trying to pray to change somebody, like I'm going to pray to change my spouse. I'm going to pray to change my boss. I'm going to pray to change. I'm going to pray to get all, I don't like this. I'm going to pray. Now we do understand we get in prayer and God does a work through our prayer. There's no doubt about it. But I'm just saying, if our mindset is I need to pray because this situation, this person is bothering me and we got to get that done. You're missing the aspect of what God wants to do in your prayer life because God is more interested in changing you than he maybe is in then changing, you know, this little situation that you're dealing with. And that's what it is to be a mature Christian. To be a mature Christian recognizes what I go through in my life might be hard, but it might be God sent. See, the immature Christian just wants things to change because they're uncomfortable and they don't like it. But the mature Christian says, whatever God has for me, whatever I'm going through right now, I know that God is with me and he may be using hard situations to shape me, to conform me, to mold me into his image and into his person and into his likeness. And prayer puts you in that mold to be shaped unto Christ. God does not want to shape you to be like your mother. God is not trying to make you like his, like your grandfather. God wants to shape you until the likeness that he has for you. I like the old adage, you know, Billy Graham, he used to do this thing. Some of you saw it in, in, when he was doing it. But he would do these altar calls, the great evangelists of the last century. And he would fill these stadiums with people and he would preach the gospel so clear, so strong, so righteous, so gospel centered. We need some more of that in our nation today. And he said, and then they, he would say, if now if you want to receive Christ, he was real passionate. If you want to receive Christ, come to these altars and fill them up. And people would come. You remember the stories from our last century. People would come in droves. People would fill the bottoms of those stadiums in, in, in receiving salvation unto God. And, and they had this thing that they would do. They would always uh, play this song, Come As I Am. And that's a great place to meet people. Hey, because you know, you're not bad enough to be received by God. Come just, you don't have to clean up yourself, get yourself right to come to God. No, you just come to God. This is what they were saying. And that's a beautiful thing. That's what grace is all about. But, but I hope that they told them, but now that you've come with all your mess, now God wants to change you. Now God wants to change you. Cut those things away. Shape that heart. Strengthen the inner man. That's what God wants to do. And prayer is that way to make that happen in your life. So let's 
think through, God, in what way do you want me to pray? You know, prayer is as easy as breathing. Prayer is as easy as talking. Prayer, if you, you stumble in your prayers, that's right, you just start. Say, say, thank you, God. That's a prayer. I love you, God. That's a prayer. Help me, God. That's a prayer. I love you, Lord. That's a prayer. It's how you do it. It's how you start. And God begins to build you more and more and more. And he gives you that appetite. It's like a baby. How am I about to find this out? A fresh and a new. You give, you give a baby some carrots. They eat like half the spoon, spit out the rest, right? Then you, you build them up, but eventually that person becomes a full-fledged adult person that can eat and consume and make decisions and eat whatever they need to do, right? Thank you, God. I love you, God. Help me, God. These are prayers. Let's pray for you today. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. Lord, I just lift up each one of them today, and I thank you, Lord, for spiritual hunger coming into their life today. Spiritual hunger. Lord, a desire for you today. And I want to ask you today with your heads bowed, if you say, Dan, I need to take the first step today. Today, I need to take the first step, which is to accept Christ as my Lord. I want to pray for you today. I'm not talking about have you been to church before? Have you been in a building before? I'm saying have you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord? And to forgive you of your sins. If that's you today and you say, Dan, I want to pray that prayer. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want him to enter my life. I want to serve him. If that's you, raise your hand right now with everybody, every head bowed, every eye closed. You say, Dan, pray for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm seeing hands raised. Amazing, amazing. God sees your heart. I want us to all to pray this today. If you raised your hand, obviously partner with this prayer. It's a confession. It's a belief. Let's all pray this. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. I put my trust in you. I put my faith in Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Lord, I thank you for this, these hearts today who've prayed that. And Lord, I believe that you are doing a special work in their life. Lord, we pray for all households in this place. Every household represented in this building today, oh God, do a mighty work. Partner with me today, church. I believe when God comes in, He comes in to do a mighty work. When God messes around, it's not an insignificant thing. He can birth galaxies when He breathes. Can He not do anything that is needed in your life and family? So, Lord, we just thank you for each heart. We put our hearts on the altar today, and we believe that you're doing a work. We love you today. We honor you. And, Lord, we bless you. And we receive these things today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, let's give God a clap of praise for what he's doing in our midst and in our hearts. Thank you, Lord.